Let's just keep worshiping. Thank You, Jesus. Father, we thank You that You're the God that cannot lie. And Father, when the Word tells us to put our trust in You, that we can put our trust in You knowing that Your promises never fail. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus, for what You've done. Father, sometimes when we don't see the promises come together or, or happen as quick as we want them to, there's things in our life that need to be cleaned out. And Father, tonight, I'm asking for Your glory, Your fire, Your glory, Your presence, Your fire. And Father, that'll clean out the chaff. Father, it's not for us to go around picking for chaff, but Your Holy Spirit will clean it out and Father, we already thank You for eyes being opened to a greater understanding that we can know the hope of Your calling. And not just the hope of Your calling, but the inheritance that we are to You, Lord. <laughs> the inheritance that we are. Father, the inheritance that You've made us become. We're Your sons and Your daughters. We sang earlier tonight, I once was lost. Aren't you glad it was just once? <laughs> Aren't you glad it was just once? Now you're royalty. Now you're sons and daughters of the King. Well, Jay... Pastor Jay, we, we don't feel like royalty. Aren't you glad we don't go by our feelings? Aren't you glad that you can go by what the Word says, what God says about you? You're not a worm after you're born again. After you're born again, you get the nature of God in you. You get your DNA changed. And your DNA becomes the Son of God, the daughter of the King. And that will change your life. That will change your life. Amen? Well, one way we love God is how? By loving one another. Aren't you glad you're tested in every area of life? Sometimes even by hugs. Welcome somebody. <laughs> Say thank you for coming to Church of the Word. Give them a hug. Please be seated, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Church of the Word. If you could be seated, that would be awesome. So good to see every smiling face tonight. It's good to be here. So I would just go over the announcements. Tomorrow evening, we will have youth night here at church from 6.30 to 8.30. All youth are welcome. Um, Tuesday evening, there will be no Bible study this week. We are going to have construction work going on in the building. So, no Bible study on Tuesday. And also, next Saturday evening, or yes, Saturday evening breaks off our week of meetings, or what is it, nine days to be exact, <laughs> um, with uh, guest speaker Bob Hawk, which will begin Saturday evening, October 9th. Um, at through, and it will go through Sunday, October 17th. The evening services begin at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday morning services at 10.30. And also next Saturday morning, for those who are doing LTS, we will meet here at church at 8.30. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all again. Um, you can turn with me. I'm not sure where. Um, I think it will be Ephesians 5. Tonight I'm going to be talking on, is it God's will for you to know His will? Is it God's will to know, how did it say that? Is it God's will for you to know His will? Ephesians 5.17 is, I mean, would be one scripture that should settle that. But, you know, I guess before we get into this, does anybody need an offering envelope? Raise your hand. And, yes, no. So Ephesians 5.17 says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. 
God does not want you to be unwise. He wants you to be wise to His will for your life. And, because this is a subject for me that for years, you know, what's the will of the Lord? You know, does He want us to know His will? He does want you to know His will. There's also a scripture I just want to share with you. Um, Faithful is he that calleth you, he also will do it. If he's called you, he's willing to finish it. It's, it's not a, really up to us to pour ourselves out of the mud by our own bootstraps. So, Of course, I want to go to Romans 12.2. That's the one I want to more focus on. Romans 12.2 is a scripture that has been in my tool chest for many years. Starts off Romans twelve two says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The way I used to look at that is, you know, be not conformed to this world. Be not, you know, don't look like the world and all that. You know, don't think like them. Which that's true. Don't think like them. But it's not. We don't transform ourselves by working on the outside. It's by starting on the inside. That's what I want to look at some of these words. It says, but be ye transformed. That word transform actually has a word renewing of your mind I want to look at. It says, it's called, the renewing is renovation. And I just had to think about when next week they're going to be renovating these staircases over here. I pray the grace of God over you for the, <laughs> to tackle that in this week. But by the renewing of our mind, he wants to start by renovating our mind, taking out all the, the junk that was in there, old belief systems, you know, like the world thinks that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. But we don't have to believe that way because we have hope. Because we have hope. And we don't need to get the, the needle because we don't have to fear that, that like the viruses and stuff is going to come on us. Because he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. Then this scripture goes on down to getting into the will. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Of course, that word good could mean good, which does mean good. And it also could mean useful or beautiful. So. And then acceptable is fully agreeable. So God wants to know His fully agreeable will. And of course, perfect, which is com- would mean complete. He wants us to walk in His completeness for our lives. Thank you, Lord. I have this here quote wrote, written down. I don't, I'm not sure if it comes from anybody or not, but the only way we're allowed to pray, not my will, but thine be done, is if we know the Father's will and don't want to do it. I don't know if that, hopefully that makes sense. The only way we're allowed to pray, not my will, but thine be done, is if we know the Father's will, but don't want to do it. Where I come up with that is like Jesus when he was in the garden praying, not my will, but thy will be done. He was asking the Father to take the cup away, the cross. He didn't want to go to the cross, but he knew the Father's heart and his will for his life. But he still asked. But thank God he laid down his flesh for us. So he said, not my will, but thine be done. And where I'm coming from in that area is like growing up in religion, People will just throw that out there. What's the Father's will? Or they pray a prayer and end it with, not my will, but thine be done. We're like, well, is it the Father's will? We can know. We have promises in the Scripture of what God's will is for. Well, at least well, I got one or two here. Here we have a Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. But even your sanctification, that's the Father's will, is your sanctification. And we can obtain that by faith in what Jesus did on the cross. And then here, First Titus 2.4 is also one that 
who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So we have scripture that shows us that what the Father's will is in different areas of our life. So I just want to leave that with y'all. Curtis, you want to pass off me? And I guess we have worship team tonight, but let's uh, bring our offerings to the Lord. If you want to, you can stand up and raise your offering to the Lord or tithe. We'll worship the Lord in this. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity then to give into your kingdom, Father, to worship you in this will, in this way, Father, with our tithes and offering, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that you've promised that you will open the windows of heaven and that you will rebuke the devourer. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I was uh, talking about God being willing. Um, I had to repent before the Lord this last week. Um, you know, he, he's, he's willing that we give, right? I mean, that's, we have that for tithe and offering that, he, that we ought to know God's will. Well, one of His wills is sowing and reaping and giving, right? And uh, the Lord just spoke to me and says, you know, um, Jay, you should never have a yard sale. Now, he was ministering to me, so you guys, if you have yard sales, that's on you. But I just realized that if we really believe in sowing and reaping, I would not have a yard sale. A couple people nodding. Some women going, uh, no, why? Well, I mean, that's where I get my deals. <laughs> I said for me, and part of what brought this on was because we had a refrigerator that didn't really work, that stopped working, and we put it on Facebook, and we actually got $50 for it, and then when they came to pick it up, we gave the $50 back and said, here, be blessed. If we really believe in sowing and reaping, why wouldn't we give more? See, what keeps me, what makes me have a yard sale, I'm probably stepping on some toes, it's okay, we'll make it. If, if, we, if we have, what's the saying? If you're, if you're stepping on eggshells, make an omelet. <laughs> so we'll make omelets. Is that okay? Can we make omelets? I, I didn't say you can't go to a yard sale. So please don't hear that. I said, <laughs> I'm just saying, if I have a yard sale, I'm trying to squeeze the last dollar out of everything, everything I own. Why not give it away? So anyway, just some things the Lord was dealing with me. <laughs> and you can ask the Lord how to work that for you, okay? And so we decided, we put the, this fridge on, for, on Facebook, and then the guy came, we gave, did, did he come? And we gave him his $50 back, because we're like, you know what, asking for $50 for something that doesn't, really, doesn't work well, um, they wanted it, so we're going to sew it, and they can go get it fixed because I don't have time to get it fixed, right? And sometime we'll come up a level, and we'll give perfectly working things away. We just weren't quite there yet, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that's a great way to start tonight. Some of you aren't sure. You're like, boy, if Jay starts that, what else does he have for the rest of the night? <laughs> Hopefully you didn't tune everything out from here on out. Uh, I guess we dismiss the children. Is that what we need to do? I just figured I'd hear a few more amens. Vern came just in time to give me a hearty amen. <laughs> he didn't even know what I was talking about, so he's the only one that said it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you, uh, sowing and reaping works. And the farmer sure figured it out. And uh, we as Christians sometimes are still figuring it out, right? And uh, we're coming up. And I want to sow more. And when you sow more, you reap more. And when you reap more, you sow more. It's just that simple. And uh, as you sow and sow and reap and reap and sow and sow, you become the pipeline that God intended us to be, right? We're, we're not reservoirs, we're pipelines. And uh, there's more where that came from, right? You run out of money, 
There's more where that came from. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? You give your last dollar away, there's more where that came from. Well, tonight I want to talk specifically uh, about the Lordship of Jesus. Um, well, that's the wrong notes. I think we talked about, we did, I, I preached and ministered on this last week. And um, I believe this is something that's very important uh, for our lives. Um, and this is, this is specifically how I titled it because I believe the Lord gave me this title. The Lordship of Jesus leads us to the secret place. How many want to dwell in the secret place of the Almighty? How many want to be in His presence 24-7? How many know that it takes recognizing His Lordship to, to live there? Recognizing His Lordship to live there. Let's uh, open, we're going to look and review a little bit, but let's go back to Romans chapter 10. And uh, Romans chapter 10, um, it, it, we use all the time, how do, let's just revisit on how do you become born again? How many know it's not hard to get born again? It's not hard. I like Religion makes you jump through uh, different, all kinds of steps. I remember getting ready for uh, my baptismal service and Somebody came to me and said, I think I was 13 at the time, 12 or 13 at the time, and I was told, well, the reason we have, um, we, what did we call the several weeks we had? Um, I remember staying in class. It would have been like a foundational instruction class. That's what they called it. And we had instruction class, and I remember somebody uh, telling me, saying, we're looking for fruit in your life so that you qualify for baptism." Aren't you glad that's not how we operate now? It's very simple on how to get born again, but very specific on how to get born again. How many know you first got to believe there's a Jesus? And see, this became a little clearer for me um, uh, when I was in Iraq and, and Turkey because preaching over there, people there believe there's a Jesus. The, the, the Islamic culture teaches there is a Jesus. So what's different from what they believe than what I believe? We need to know this, right? One, one of the things that, that they do not believe is they do not believe in the divinity of Jesus. He was simply a prophet, right? And I'm like, ah, that's the difference. Jesus is not just about believing on Jesus and believing what He did on the cross, but it's also recognizing and understanding that He's your Lord. See, when you understand that Jesus is your Lord, see, you're recognizing that He's God. See, that separates us from any religion in the world. Any uh, there, There's not uh, 500 ways to heaven. You can't get to heaven through Buddha and, and, and Muhammad and all these different places. Some people teach, New Age will teach, that all these roads lead to the same place. There's one thing that's different. is I, Yes, there is a Jesus. Yes, I believe on Him. And then number two, I recognize His Lordship in my life. And I believe this is something that the American church has slipped in. Has slipped in His Lordship. When Jesus is head of the church, when Jesus is Lord, when He's seated in the heavenly places, yes, uh, I've been teaching a lot of, on, uh, on being in Him and being seated with Him and taking our authority here on the earth like God intended, right? God intended us to walk in the authority that He gave us. In other words, you have authority over the devil, you have authority over the negative circumstances in your life. In other words, if you're having things happen in your life that you don't like, you can step, put your foot out and say, you know what, it stops now, it stops tonight, we're not going to have it anymore. And you can take authority in that. But one of the things that I believe has slipped is Jesus is Lord. See, a lot of times, God asks me to do something. <laughs> And I sit there deciding if I want to. I'm, I'm actually acting like what I want to do is actually something uh, in equal importance of what He wants me to do. 
And if we understand His Lordship and understand how Lord He really is in my life, then we will learn to be instantly obedient. See, people at pulp, uh, from the pulpit, pastors have said, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And we sit here and we sing songs about trust. We say we trust. We say, oh yeah, no problem. And then the Lord speaks and ministers to us and then we find out how little we trust Him. Because we're like, eh, I don't know if I want to do that. In fact, I want to do the opposite. <laughs> See, we, we want to do the opposite because we don't believe that He has our best interests in mind. And if we understand that God is actually for me. See, it's not my job to come up here and pick apart and point out all the imperfections in your life. And pastors have done that for far too long. Churches have done that. Religion has done that. But we need to understand that God is love and He draws all men to Himself. And he's, as He draws you to Him, let the Holy Spirit minister those things to your life. And when the Holy Spirit ministers those things, let me tell you, He does a much better job than me pointing them out. And the last thing you need when you already know the imperfections in your life is some pastor to point it out. Now, there is some correction. I'm not throwing correction out the window. There's correction that is needed sometimes. But in general, that is not how it ought to work. And, and see, if we learn to dwell in the secret place, if we learn to get uh, and understand His Lordship and get to that place, then we allow the Holy Spirit to minister those good things. God is a good God. See, for years I thought everything otherwise. I was sure that he had Jay picked out on this earth. And I was sure that his full intention of being God, or his full reason of being God, and the full reason that I even existed was to punish me. <laughs> Those were the thought processes. See, you cannot serve Love and make Jesus Lord of your life when you have those thought processes. See, Romans 2 says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. <laughs> Not the hellfire sermon. Not the hellfire sermon. I mean, I grew up getting the hell scared out of me. And I wasn't, you know, I, there was sermons I sat in and I was pretty sure my heel was burning. And I'm sliding in there and I'm in fear. And you cannot bring people closer to Jesus by placing that fear on them. What draws all men to Himself is His love. And see, that love is experienced when we get in the secret place. When we get into that secret place of fellowship with the Father, we begin to experience His love. And when we experience His love, then we can have a relationship. See, if, if, if my four children are constantly in fear of Dad, what kind of relationship would we have? I remember Connor, uh, when he was, thank God, he's too... He was too young to remember this. He was probably about six months old. And of course, at that time in my life, I had a lot of issues. And one, and one of the issues was, uh, well, my children are going to be different than all those other people's children that run around like their hair's on fire. And uh, I remember when before we had children, we'd hang out with other married couples. And these other married couples, I mean, we couldn't even eat at a restaurant. And it annoyed the tar out of me. Because we couldn't have we we couldn't even eat at a restaurant. And Kim and I are just newlyweds and we're wanting I mean, we went out to eat every weekend. And I mean, multiple times a week, you know, and we go out with friends. We can't even have a conversation. And I purpose in my heart that my children are not going to be like that. And I remember one day, as unspiritual as I was, it just hit me. 
who I found, I raised my hand, had nothing to do with anything, and Connor winced. It broke me. Because I realized I wasn't trying to do anything to him, but when I raised my hand, he winced, and he thought he was going to get slapped. It broke me right there. That is not how to raise my child. So then we just used a spoon. <laughs> but at least he didn't win so when I raised my hand. He just walked in the big circle around the spoon. I remember one time it fell out of Kim's purse and Connor's crawling or walking, I don't remember, and it was sitting out there in the middle of the living room and he just looked at it and he walked way out around it. And, and, but, but the reason I'm uh, telling you that story is I was doing it the wrong way. I was, trying, I was trying to make him something. I was trying, and, and, and how many know that if I reflect that to my children, it, it, and the reason I reflected it to my children is because that's what I thought my God did. That's what I thought my God did to me. And I found out that I can't actually love him and have a correct relationship with him with that kind of attitude. Lee said a little earlier that we got to renew our minds. See, the reason we got to renew our minds is we got to get some of that old junk out. Because maybe you were taught incorrectly. It was probably the best. It was, I am sure that most parents, if not all parents, are raising their children with the best intentions. But how many know that intentions don't get you anywhere? If intentions were enough, we'd all be skinny, rich, and happy. I have a book by that title. If intentions were enough, we'd all be skinny, rich, and happy. See, intentions don't do it. We need to think different. And when we start thinking different, then there actually is a change that happens to my life. And I can be changed. And I had to understand that God loves me. And I had to get to the understanding that He's a good Father. See, it took me, it's still taken me time to get there. I'm not there, but I sure have left. <laughs> right? The train has left the station. I haven't reached my destination, but we sure have left the station. And I understand a lot more about the love of God than I did, but I sure have a long ways to go yet. I haven't exhausted understanding the love of God. I haven't exhausted how good He wants to be to me. And see, that goodness, when you understand that goodness, that He puts that goodness on you, He wants to be so good to you that if you have a soft heart and cultivate a soft heart and you uh, begin to fellowship with Him in His presence, then uh, repentance comes. Because as you trust Him more, you turn more things of your life over to Him. Isn't that beautiful? You turn more things over to Him. And the Holy Spirit will tap you on the shoulder and say, well, what about this? And He does it in such a loving way. And you understand He has your back. How many have ever been stabbed in the back? By your, maybe your wife or your husband. <laughs> How many know it hurts the most? by the people closest to us. And that's real. The people closest to us actually hurt us the most because we least expect it there. Right? And so sometimes things happen and, and, and <laughs> it's uncomfortable. But how many know that we got a uh, God never, ever stabs us in the back? Now, the Satan will try to convince you otherwise. He'll be like, oh yeah, remember that time? God wasn't with you at that point. God wasn't for you. He didn't have your best interests in mind. What keeps me from recognizing the Lordship of Jesus in my life, the thing, the lie that keeps me from recognize it, recognizing that is if Jesus really is 100% Lord, then i got to live a boring life. Then i got to live a subpar life. Then i got to live a life of, of, you know, it's just not any fun life. 
Remember the, the story about the lady that she wasn't sure if she wanted to get born again because she, she liked to dance. I may know this story. Right? I've said it many times, but I'm going to say it again. So she comes into the service. It was Dale was uh, preaching that night. And she comes up in the prayer line, and, and Dale asks, well, what do you want from Jesus? Well, she sort of wants to get born again, but she likes to go around to the bars and dance, and uh, she doesn't want to get born again because then she'd have to stop. And Dale just t- tells her, he's like, well... Um, you can dance after you're born again. How many know you can dance after you're born again? In this church, you're allowed to dance. Right? And, and she's like, oh, fine. Okay, she'll get born again. She believes on Jesus and she receives Him. He's Lord of my life. She leaves the church service. She's all excited. She's all happy. And uh, I, I believe she was gone for two weeks and she comes through the doors two weeks later, and she comes up to Dale, and she goes, you tricked me. And she's wiggling her finger under his nose. And Dale goes, why? What? What did I do? And, he, and she goes, I no longer want to go to the bars. How many know that he puts a new heart in us? He puts new desires in us. And it will fulfill you. You're here on a Saturday night. <laughs> you could have done a lot of stuff, right? Why, does, why do I prepare for Saturday nights? Because I respect your time. <laughs> it's one of the reasons, not all, the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. Because if, if I would just haphazardly, um, you know, just, well, I'll preach just whatever and, and not do anything, I wouldn't be respecting you. You're coming here to receive something from heaven. Right? And so there's preparation in that. There's time that needs to be spent with the Lord for that so that I can give the correct thing for you. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one that ministers. The Holy Spirit's the one that teaches. I'm just led. But I do need practice and I need to understand what to be led into. <laughs> Ever find a Spirit-filled person that wasn't led by God? Yes, I'm one of them. (laughs) There's been times I wasn't led properly. There was times I allowed the enemy to come in and use me as a tool. There was times I let my flesh get the best of me, right? So even we can be tongue-talking, spirit-filled people, and there's still some areas of sanctification in my life needed. But it's the Lord's will that we're sanctified. (laughs) And we know that. And those are the things that we work on in our lives and we continue to ask the Lord, get us to a better place. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 9. Did I read Romans 10, 9 and 10? Well, let's read Scripture before we move on. Romans 10, 9 and 10. I will not be a pastor that does not take the Bible into the pulpit. I will always take the the Word into the pulpit. Why? Because I'm not here for a self-help sermon. I'm here to preach the Word. Romans 10, verses, uh, verse 9, or let's go back to verse 8, but what does it say? The Word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach. What do we preach? The Word of faith. What does it take to believe on Jesus? Anybody here physically seen Jesus? Now some of you may have had a vision or a dream where it, it, that you've seen Jesus, but how many of you have fit that you could pinch Him And you could, I mean, he was just as real as Connor sitting here, right? It takes faith to believe on Jesus. How many have seen Jesus on the cross? How many saw it? How many were there 2,000 years ago? Anybody there? Were you there when he was resurrected? Were you there when his body began to shake and the tombstone was rolled away? Well, if you were there, you were a Roman soldier. And if you if you didn't believe in getting slain in the spirit, you did then. Because 50 Roman soldiers just went (laughs) and were like dead men. Right? It's the power of God. And Jesus rose from the grave. Were you there? No. So then that means you have to use faith. Faith is believing in something you can't see. Right? So you have to choose. It's a choice. You have to choose to believe that there is a Jesus. Right? You have to believe. And that's faith. 
Faith is believing in things you can't, or something that you cannot see, you cannot necessarily prove in the natural, but you begin to know it in your spirit. Faith. Faith is believing that there is a Jesus. But then there's also faith in believing and confessing because what comes out of your mouth is the result of something that's in your heart. And you're saying, Jesus is my God. He is my Lord. What He says goes. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. I know we're sort of just reviewing from last week, but um, I don't know, anybody ever have steak the second time? I mean, I got Ryan sitting in here, so I mean, I know he loves to grill steak over and over again, even though he perfectly knows well how good it's going to (laughs) taste. And you just chew it, and you just say, that's good. And then the next day, you grill some more. And the next day, you, you, you make some more. And you chew that steak, and you say, oh, wow, that's the best steak I ever had. I heard that's the best steak I ever had so often. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to be eating here in a bit, but it's the best steak I ever had. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, verse 3. Well, verse 1, Saul, I want you to see what he was doing. Then Saul, which later became Paul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. How many know that Saul was committing murder? He was killing people. Maybe you think you did things that were really awful and terrible. I doubt if you're up to this level. right? Killing people. Taking innocent people's lives. It's murder. He's breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone. How many want a suddenly in your life? (laughs) How many want an encounter with Jesus in your life? I want suddenlies. Sometimes it comes up when you're not really ready and you have a suddenly. I remember having suddenlies in my car where I'm like, Lord, I need to be able to see just to drive. Right? Because when I have suddenlies, I usually cry. Maybe you laugh or scream, I don't know, but uh, I cry. And uh, I remember uh, suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm sitting... Uh, at a light here in Delta, and the Lord just begins to minister to me. And He says that I, that He loved me and that uh, I'm doing what He... And he thanked me, begins to thank me for doing what He asked me to do. Well, suddenly there was a river of tears and the light turned green. And I couldn't see to drive, right? So you can have suddenlies in your life and the Lord ministers to you in a very strong way way. And when He ministers to you in that way, be ready to receive it. Because when you can receive those things, those encounters with Him, you're learning to dwell in those secret places. And see, when you make Him Lord of your life, I'm telling you, you'll have more suddenlies. I didn't have suddenlies before. I didn't even know what it was. Right? Right? But then when I made Him Lord, it became a difference. I received Jesus and prayed the sinner's prayer at 15 years old, and I had an encounter with God with as much as I could in a religious environment, right? As much as was possible at that time. But in a month or two, it was squashed, and the light went out. Religion squashed what I had encountered. And it didn't wake up, and it didn't... How do I want to say it? It just... I believe I was born again, even though I would have questioned it in times in my life. I still believe I was born again. I just didn't know how to exercise it. I didn't know how to renew my mind because you need the Holy Spirit to speak to you through the Word so that your mind is renewed, right? And I didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. I was like, in, in, in there's other chapters in Acts where they came up to these disciples and they're like, hey, have you heard about the Holy Spirit? And they go, we haven't even heard there was one. 
Right? There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people that don't know much about the Holy Spirit, if any. Well, yeah, it's one of those weird things about God that we don't really understand. But see, the Holy Spirit was poured out on this earth. It was put inside you, and it was also available to go on you so that you could actually read Scripture and get revelation. But see, if I'm reading Scripture without the Holy Spirit, it's just the dead letter of the law. I just found a whole lot of stuff in there I had to do and I didn't want to do. Right? It's just sitting there. And it wasn't until I got full of the Holy Spirit and really made Jesus my Lord. Jesus became my Lord. He became my Master. I said, you know what? What you say is good for me. You ever wonder why God says don't do things? You ever why, you wonder why the Word says uh, there's different scriptures in the words, abstain from these things. Is it just because God gets cranky and He doesn't like you to do stuff? Is that why He says these things? No, He says it because He wants to protect you from the pain and the grief that those things bring. The pain and the grief that those things bring. And so He says, don't do these things. And He's saying, he's saying it with the love of if you do them, it'll hurt you. Right? But yet, a lot of us have to figure it out on our own. Any, any young children here that had to learn what a hot stove was? Anybody here? You, you learned what a hot stove was. Mama says it was hot. But I mean, there's just something natural. And man, we got to check it out. And we got to see. And then we jump back and we scream in, in pain and run to mom and cry. And mom comforts us and says... I told you not to touch it. Right? Well, in a lot of these things, the, the, it is the same way with God. He lets us make our choices, but He's trying to protect me. It's His love. It's not uh, the, waiting to punish me. It's not for His hammer to fall on my head. It's not uh, authority abuse. It's His love so that you don't hurt yourself. Just like your child. I don't care who it is. I don't care how many to times you told your child as a parent to not touch the hot stove. You might have told them ten times. But one day they touch them. Do you just stand there and say, well, I told you not to touch it. And dear Lord, I mean, I'm just, you don't get any of my pity. Or I'm not comforting you. I, I'm just not going to nurture you. I'm not even going to put a band-aid on your thumb. No, none of us parents would do that. We wrap them up, we get them in our laps, and we say, and we and it can be a teaching lesson, and we say, Well, isn't this the reason? I was trying to tell you that it hurts. Right? I'm trying to get over to you that that's not a good thing. When it's red hot. Alarm bells go off in your head. And from that point on, you know from two, three, four, five years old, you'll remember the rest of your life, Isaac, right? You'll remember that you touched something you shouldn't have touched. And the next time you see a red hot burner, you just look at it and go, ooh, it's red hot. I ain't touching that thing. And just like Connor, you make a big detour around that, right? Let's go back to Acts chapter 9. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and, he, and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now how many know that Saul did not know he was persecuting Jesus? In fact, he has, I believe... He, um, it's a little bit like sometimes we, we say good things about different people. And, 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 uh, and here's a place in Scripture that we find it. We find that Paul or Saul is very sincere. Have you ever met sincere people in this world? Have you been very sincere in what you did? I mean, you did it with all your heart. Right? What does sincerity mean? You're doing something or you believe something with all your heart and suddenly... Saul has a suddenly. Suddenly, he's realizing that something he believed with all of his heart and he was in complete sincerity and he was sincerely wrong. You ever been sincerely wrong? I mean, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I mean, you repent. 
right? Because you're like, I wasn't meaning to be hurtful. I wasn't meaning to be this way. I mean, I was sincere, but I was passionate about what I believed because I was completely sincere. How many know that Islam is full of sincere people? I mean, how many of you are willing to blow yourself up for Jesus? You can find a whole bunch of them. Right? How many of you are willing to die for Jesus? You can find a whole bunch of Islamic people, that the, the Muslim people that with the Islamic religion that are sincere. I mean, you have to be sincere to strap on a bomb around you and walk into a crowd. You've got to be sincere, but you're sincerely wrong. Right? So sincere, it's, being sincere isn't the only thing. So Saul's being, he has a suddenly, he realizes he's sincerely wrong. And, and something, the reason I believe he, that, that I'm showing you this, that he's so sincere is the next verse. He goes and he said, Who are you, Lord? See, I believe he spoke maybe before he thought. Bright light shining. I believe in that light, he's seeing Jesus. So the issue of, of, I believe this is where Saul got born again. This is where I believe he got born again. He's seeing Jesus because Jesus came to visit him. And Jesus was able to come to visit him because of his heart, because of the sincerity of his heart, and also because Stephen prayed for him. That's another thing, I'm not going to get into that. But go back and read Stephen's prayer and who was standing on the sideline. It was Saul. Stephen interceded for Saul and it gave a window of opportunity for the Spirit to come in and give Saul a suddenly in his life. And so now Saul is there going, who are you, Lord? Because suddenly he realizes that his whole belief system is a little is being shaken is being shaken, and he's meeting Jesus face to face, but he calls him Lord. You know, you don't call your worst enemy Lord, do you? You don't call the person that you're going against Lord. I believe that the, the believing happened, wow, this is Jesus. Oh my word, this is Jesus. And he immediately in that same breath he believes on Him, and then He confesses that Jesus is Lord. And He becomes born again on the spot. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks. You ever been going the complete wrong way you should have been going? And you thought it was God? I mean, you had the best intentions. You were very sincere. And then at some point, something arrested you to the point that, whoa, this is not God. I've had times in my life, after I'm spirit-filled, after I'm tongue-talked, how many know that sometimes we pick up stuff we shouldn't? How many have ever done something that was not spirit-led? After you're spirit-filled. Praying in the Spirit. We can still get off track. Right? And, and then all of a sudden we realize we have a suddenly in our life where, where the Holy Spirit ministers to us and we go, whoa, I shouldn't be doing that. I need to be doing this. And a lot of times for me, I'll, I'll say how it works for me, a lot of times I get off track by doing good things. I mean, come on. The devil knows better than throwing a, something bad at me. So, and I become too caught up or too busy doing good things. How many know that if you have too many good things in your life, it becomes a bad thing? If you have too many good things that you no longer get into the secret place, it becomes a bad thing. None of them are bad in of themselves, but just because they're good does not mean it was God. Just because it's good does not mean it's God. There is more good things for you to do tomorrow than you can possibly 
fill your hours with. There's enough life-changing, world-changing things for you to do tomorrow than you could possibly do in a 24-hour period. So you have to not just do good things, you have to do God things. And sometimes it takes time in the secret place saying, God, what do you want me to do? So he, trembling and astonished, said, what did he say? Lord, (laughs) you ever do that? Do you ever get before the Lord and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's trembling and astonished. His whole life is taking a U-turn right now. See, we can talk about change. We can want change. We can desire change. We can think about change. But at some point, we need to change. I can talk about the gym. I can talk to Ryan about CrossFit. I can talk to uh, Ryan about all the stars he's met and taken selfies with. You know, I can, I mean, we can just really get into it about all these CrossFit stars. We can talk about workouts. We can talk about all the workouts we ought to do. We, we could, we could talk about, oh, this is, you know, we're going to wake up at five in the morning. We're going to do all this. We could do, you know, we could have all the workouts every day of the week planned for months. But that doesn't change me till I wake up at five in the morning and say, you know what, this morning I'm going to the gym. And I get myself out of bed and I get there. See, you don't get to dwell in the secret place until you decide to make Jesus Lord of your life. And when you make Him Lord of your life and say, you know what, time out, I'm for 30 minutes going to spend time with Him. The creator of the universe, you know, um, maybe the CrossFit. Uh, what's his name? Not Fraser. Um, Froning. Maybe maybe Froning's going around going, man, I got a picture with Ryan. <laughs> but see, you get to hang out with God. And we need to put that on the top of our list. I'm preaching to myself. We need to put that in the top of our list. He's number one in my life. And if He's number one in my life, the time with Him is valuable. I told you the story, but I had to... And, and some of you... Uh, I even had one person ask me this last week. I think it was this last week. Maybe it was two weeks ago. Uh, if I, He was number six in my life. <laughs> and I... It was just a chuckle. But I had to sit a person down and explain to them that they were number five. And I had to just set the expectations of, in order of where they came. I'm like, number one's God and my time with God. Okay, So if you call me when I am having my time with God, I am not answering the phone. You know how disrespectful it is when, you, when you're having a conversation? And uh, somebody's there texting. Yeah, uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're not hearing a word you're saying. And basically, what you're telling them is this conversation I'm having here on my phone is way more important than the one I'm having here. And uh, they're very letting you know, and, and, and they're doing it right in front of you, so they're letting you know that. Uh, they're letting you know it, is what I'm trying to say, right? In the same way, it's part of the reason when I'm having a conversation, somebody ought to be having my full attention. Because if they don't have my full attention, I'm, I'm thinking of something else. And a lot of times I'm thinking of what I'm going to answer instead of hearing them. <laughs> right? All of these things are just signs that you're really not interested in the person at all. And you're not really wanting to connect. You're just you know, putting up with them till the time is over, right? And you're never going to get on a heart-to-heart level that way. And when I'm with God, if I'm constantly watching videos and texting people and looking at people while I'm having God time, that's what I'm telling God. And I had to explain to this person, they're number five. 
Number one was God. Number two was my wife. She gets attention before just anybody else. Number three are my children. They're going to get attention usually. And I can work at this. I'm not perfect at this at all. Right? But then I need to make sure they get the time they need with Daddy. Isn't that what I'm trying to teach them? My time with God, their time with me. And, and we even got corrected two weeks ago on, on making sure we take that time with our children. Because as pastors, sometimes you get so wrapped up doing good things. And, and a lot of people want attention and they want to come talk or they take your time. It's very easy because we have their trust. See, we have our children's trust. They trust us. And then because they trust us, we're like, eh, just wait. Just wait. It's okay. And we push them aside. And we were just told to take a look at it. It was said very lovingly, but you know what? We need to make sure our children have time with mommy and daddy, which is what I'm wanting to do with God the Father. Because if I have that time, I can give this time. I didn't sort of forget what number four was, but I remember that he was five. So I forget what my number four was. Uh, I had something. And uh, yeah, they were five. And, but I had to lay that out to him because uh, I needed him to understand that there was an order in my life. And uh, a lot of times, uh, these phones, and, and it's, I, I use my phone all the time. I have my phone in my hand a lot. But i got to constantly remind myself that it's just a phone and I'm not married to it. I'm not attached to it. I can do without it. And it's amazing. I mean, I finally, there for a long time, I had my wallet attached to my phone because I never forgot my phone, but I would constantly annoy my wife and forget my wallet. So finally, I'm like, brilliant, Amazon. You put a wallet on a phone case. So I stuck my wallet on my phone case, and let me tell you, I never forgot my wallet. But, but one of those things that you have to look at, can I go an hour or two or an afternoon without my phone. Can I even do that? And if it does go, bzzz, do I have to answer it? Do I have to look at it? No, you don't. You can be free. Well, I was trying to get a hold of you. So? So? I mean, there was an I, I'm in the, some of you are in the same generation. We're in the generation that they that I remember running my business this way. You had the voicemail on a handheld phone at your desk, and you would come home from working all day without a phone. I mean, can you imagine that? It's a little hard to remember that. A little hard to imagine it. No phone all day. Yeah, Connor, this was actually possible. <laughs> all day without a phone. And I would come home and I'd listen to the voicemail and sometimes call them back or call them back first thing the next morning. That actually existed. Right? Your time with God is more important than any electronic device you can have. Let's just make sure we keep those things in perspective. Right? Acts chapter 9. Verse 5, And He said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. So He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want Me to do? Immediately, there's a willingness. Saul had his agenda planned. He had his Google Calendar all set up. Everybody got the notifications. All the emails went out. He's going to Damascus. Right? He's going to Damascus. He has a suddenly. And, and now he's saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city. I find that interesting because it was still in Damascus. <laughs> 
I mean, God will work with, with you, right? So he goes into the city. Arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Told what you must do. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. God just left them. He, he just cut them out of that suddenly. And, and Saul didn't even really uh, explain it to him. I mean, they were speechless. And he didn't spend uh, hours trying to tell them what happened. Right? Well, you know, huh, seeing Jesus, uh, he gets up. He, uh, Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Well, then we have the story of Ananias. Well, he, had a, he also had a sudden one. I mean, when the Lord would minister to you in your secret time, in your, t- in your time with God, God ministers to you to go talk to the very man that's killing, that wants to kill you. You got to make sure you heard from God, right? You got to make sure you heard from God. And Ananias wasn't so sure, but he did go minister, and he did go do what the Lord asked him to do. The reason I'm showing you these things these happen these things can happen now. If I want to get ready for a, a, a Um, if I want change in my life, I want to say it this way, if I actually do want change in my life, then I need to get to, I need to spend time with the Father to get those, that change. I remember in business, in my, in my uh, times that I've owned my own businesses, not knowing what to do. I remember being in, in, in Aspen, uh, particularly, we were in Aspen, and I had prayed for a job. Um, I, I, I just I, I wanted to um, be successful in, in 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 what I was doing, and and we we were praying and believing God for, for bigger jobs and better jobs, and and uh, sometimes. And then I, I remember when when the Lord blessed us with a job, then I was whining and complaining to Him about this job, and then the Lord reminded me that I had asked Him for it, right. And then I'm like, oh yeah. And, and then he ministered to me that blessing, see, blessing that God brings to us, blessing brings responsibility. And I didn't really like the responsibility, I just wanted the blessing. You know, when you're blessed with a child, with children, they bring responsibility, don't they? Right? Blessings bring responsibility. And sometimes busier businesses and bigger jobs brought more responsibility, and then I wasn't sure I liked it. And so we're doing this monster job in, in Aspen. It was a two hundred some thousand dollar job, just for the wood floors, by the way. And uh, and uh, so we're doing this job, and we we had we had a lot of color issues going on. They got really picky on the samples, and I took pictures of the sample, and I would send it to the manufacturer to get this floor made, and and for whatever reason. We did not update the correct uh, color sample with the correct code. So we'd been emailing back and forth different codes on what the different colors were, and I forgot to verify and send a picture back on the exact color that it was supposed to be. So we had been looking at similar colors, so that when this wood floor comes out to the uh, so that they proceeded to make it. And of course, a typical Aspen job, rush, rush, hurry, hurry, you're behind the eight ball, get it done, just get this wood out here. We, we just can hardly get the wood done fast enough, get it milled, get it colored. And it was pre-colored and then sent to the job site. And it got, gets to the job site and we're unloading it and I have this horrific realization that it's the wrong color. Now, you're working on a two hundred dollars to $250,000 job and you have the wrong color with your best builder and a builder that's very, very picky. You just want to throw up. i got such a knot in my stomach. I'm spirit-filled. I'm a tongue talker. But I just wanted to throw up. I just wanted to gag because I knew this was going to be a problem. And I didn't know what to do. But I knew to dwell in the secret place. And so I just took a time out, went back to the motel room, and that became my secret place. And I sat there all afternoon praying in the Spirit. 
going, Lord, what shall I do? Now that doesn't take all the fears away immediately. It doesn't take everything, all the emotion out of it. But you know what? If I can't get before the Lord, my emotions will run wild. My emotions will run wild. So finally we break the news to it. Of course, they weren't very happy with it. And, uh, but they took it well. Aren't, aren't you glad God's on your side? But they took it well. See, it was my fault. I could have taken an extra picture and made sure they had the right uh, picture there at the mill so it's the right color. But it's because I didn't. First of all, i got to take responsibility of what happened, right? Then uh, they were like, hey, well, uh, no problem. We'll send two guys out there. We got a little. Uh, uh, we got a way to get the color correct. We got to put this on. We got to hand uh, wash the whole floor with this solution, and then we'll put this color on. And it'll match the sample you want. I'm like, wow! It didn't even sound that complicated. They're like, it's going to take two days. Well, so they send uh, the, these guys out, and we have this meeting coming up because we got to figure out who's going to pay for this. And all I could think of is, Jay don't make no money on this job. You know, that's my thought process. And so we have this meeting scheduled, and it's in a couple days in the afternoon because we've got to figure this out on the phone. And it's the salesman and me in the mill. And, and, and I want to throw up again. And I'm just like, so I spent time in my secret place down at the motel room, praying in the Spirit, going, Lord... You knew, see, see, when you can find comfort in the thought that before the foundations of the world were even put in place, (laughs) before the foundations of the world even existed, God knew about this and had a solution prepared. Think about that. Isn't that awesome? And so I don't have to go there going, oh, dear Lord, please squeeze out a miracle. Because we have this idea that God's up there and He's got to, and if we pull all the right buttons and we push all the right levers, that He'll be able to pull a miracle up uh, you know, from somewhere. Because we surprised everybody. <laughs> and, and God's on His throne going, Michael, you need to get a hold of Him because he, he keeps taking all the miracle power. And the lights are dimming in heaven, right? And and the zzz, and they get dim. And oh well, Jay, he's using his miracle power. He's using it all up. There's nothing left for the rest of his life or anybody else. No, there's plenty for everybody. The miracle power is still there. We just need to tap into him. And so we get to our phone call. We get to this meeting. And, and, and I didn't know how this was going to work because there's a lot of emotion in this. There's profits on the line. And I don't know about you, but you start talking to businessmen about their profits, everybody fights. It is all... I mean, you ever watch the Discovery Channel? And, and the pride of lions takes uh, down a, 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 a wildebeest and it's each person to their own on how much they can eat in a short period of time. I mean... <laughs> right? And, and we, we start the conversation, and, and I mean, because I thought that they're going to probably make me take the whole hit. That was my thought process. And I'm going to lose all the money. We were talking about $6,000. Not the end of the world, but, you know, depending where you are in life, it's close. <laughs> it's the end of your bank account. Right? Because if you're negative so many days, the bank shuts it down. So it could be the end of your bank account. Right? And um, so uh, we're, we're talking about this and very amicable a discussion that all three of us were each going to take a $2,000 hit and spread it out over everybody. Which I, I thought was very fair. And not just that, there was enough change orders that then happened later because of changes in the stairs and things we had to do different, that we were able to make all that money back. And the end result was we didn't lose any money. But see, if you allow fear to take a hold of you and take over you, you don't think about that because you're in that moment and you need to be able to go to the secret place. And and you need to know it starts all the way from the top 
It starts with Jesus being your Lord. And then it starts with knowing what the will of the Father is. <laughs> and I had to know that God had my back. And I had to know that He had my best interests in mind. In fact, I had to come to the revelation that God wanted me successful in business. God wants me to make a profit. And if He wants me to make a profit, then, and I know that, then He wants me to succeed. Because He's for me. But I had to get that revelation from the secret place. And that happens when you spend time there. Let's go to Psalms 91. Uh, do we, can, we, can we have... Anybody give me a minute? How many minutes do people give me? Anybody give me a minute? One minute. Two minutes. One minute. Two minutes. Three minutes. Burn raids. We're going to count that. Four minutes. Five minutes. Psalms 91. You all know the verse, but I, 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 want, I want you to see why we don't do this more. First of all, let's read Psalms 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And this is what it takes to stay in the secret place. And this is what I did in my motel room. I walked around my motel room saying something. <laughs> I walked around my motel room and I'm talking and I found out that the louder I talked, the less I thought. Right? So my mouth's gone because I am saying, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. But you have to say it. You have to say it. You can't just think it. You have to say it. You have to say it. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll finish there. Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> Is this good for anybody? Hebrews chapter 11. Verse, this is the great faith chapter, but verse 6 is something so integral. And if you want to have a successful secret place with the Lord, we have to get to this place. We have to get to this place. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Why is it impossible to please God? It's not because He requires or He has a to-do list for you, but you have to have faith. I explained it earlier. You have to believe about Jesus. Jesus was the bridge between God over here and man over there, and there's a chasm, bottomless pit in the middle. There's no way to get over to God except by the bridge that Jesus had. And so when you believe on Him and make Him your Lord, see, when you make Him your Lord, you can do the rest of this verse. You can do the rest. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So you can't please Him unless you come to the Father through Jesus. When you come through the Father through Jesus, now you pleased Him. Okay? Now you pleased Him. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe. How many know that I read that earlier, chapter uh, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10? You have to believe. You have to believe on Jesus, right? You must believe that He is. How many know that you have to believe Jesus exists? If you don't ever get told that Jesus exists, you can't be saved. You can't believe that He exists. You can't believe in, in, in something you never heard of. So that's the first step. And then the second one, that uh, you, you believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. See, the problem, the reason we can't make Jesus Lord of our lives is because we don't believe He rewards. And if we would believe that He rewards me when I make Him Lord, then it'd be easy to make Him Lord. And if you hold back and say, well, I don't want to make Him Lord in my life in this area because, well, I, you reveal that you can't trust Him there. See, when we say put your trust in Him, trust in Jesus, trust in God, that trust level is He's never, ever, 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 ever broken trust. Ever. 
In the existence of mankind, God has never broken trust, but we believe lies that He might. And the enemy comes in and he tries to steal, kill, and destroy. And he comes in and he says, yeah, but God's not really for you. It's going to be boring if you serve God. We have done more serving God in business, in faith, in our money supply than we ever dreamt of doing it on our own. Because God's for us. God's for me. And and not only for me, He wants me to succeed. He's my rewarder. (laughs) And see, when we understand, if we can believe, and then we can understand that He's my rewarder, now it's easy to trust. It's easy to trust. And now, when we understand God speaks us or tells us to do something, and He has our best interests in mind, you can breathe and say, you know what, God's got this. He's got this. He wants me to succeed. He wants me to be victorious. He wants me to live in victory. That's what He wants. He wants me to always triumph. He wants me to be the head and not the tail. He wants me to be above and not beneath. He wants me to to succeed in everything I do. Everything that my hands touch, everything I do in, in, in Deuteronomy 28 is blessed. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed everywhere I go. In fact, when I start understanding it, I take His blessing with me. And when I take His blessing with me, I can enter into a house and a lady says, when you came... I got healed. When you guys walked in, my pain left. Because I'm bringing the blessing of God everywhere I go. Let's stand to our feet. But we need to, what I'm imploring to you or what I'm asking you to do, you have to trust Him. I'm asking you to trust in somebody that has never broken a promise. I'm asking you to trust somebody that is always faithful. I'm asking you to trust somebody that is got his he's got a better plan for you than anything you can concoct up or think. Anything you can come up with, he's got a better plan. And he has a better plan. Well, what if I'd have to change businesses? What if? <laughs> his plan's better. Kim and I are here because we change businesses because the Lord said sell one. And it was right at the time that in the natural didn't feel very convenient at all. In fact, we were just at the point of making more money than we ever made in our lives and the Lord said sell. And I'm like, Lord, okay, uh, I'm going to count it as sowing. (laughs) See, God and nobody, nobody on this earth can take something from you that you give them. You can't take something. Well, he took that from me. You can't if you give it to him. You can't if, if you give it. And, and when, when God's asking you to give something up, he's not being a prude, but he's asking you to give it up so he can get more over to you. <laughs> Every time he's asked me to give something up, It was better than I ever imagined later. And when I give it up, he can, he's he's doing it because it's blocking what he wants to do. And so he says, give it up. Give this up. I got something better. It's going to be more glorious than you'll ever imagine. See, he can do things above what we can even ask or think. He can do way above that. And when He's asking you to make Him Lord, you will have to give something up. Because He wouldn't ask you to make Him Lord if you wouldn't have to. But sometimes it's getting on our knees and respecting and worshiping Him for who He is and how holy He is and giving everything up that we possibly have.
It could be our spouse. It could be our children. It could be our job. It could be your business. It could be everything you know. Saul gave up everything he knew that day that he went to Damascus. Because he had a suddenly, and he got on his knees. He said, Lord, what will you have me do? And it's going to be better than anything you've ever experienced. Hang on for the ride. You think it's boring. You get into faith, you'll have the most faith roller coasters uh, rides you've ever had in your life. We're in a building where I, when the Lord ministered to me for, for this building, I wanted to go up into my bed, pull the covers over my head, and pity myself. That's what I wanted to do, but I had enough sense to go up to my bedroom and get into the secret place and say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I had wounds. I hurt because I, er, I owned, Kim and I owned six properties and we lost every one of them. And I'm going, Lord, what are you doing? Not only are you asking us to buy a property, you're asking us to buy it with the church. And it doesn't just involve me, it involves all of you. And if I fail, then everybody fails. And I don't know if I'm ready. And I had to pull myself up by the ear and say, I will do what you want me to do, Lord. And I'm going to that meeting. And I get to the meeting. And one of the gentlemen sits, sits, is sitting on the edge of the seat and he goes, how fast can we get this to happen? And everything Kim and I prayed for happened. In fact, not just everything. It ha everything happened so much that when I went ho home and told Kim, she's like, well, we should have asked for more. <laughs> but we, we asked where we were at. And he answered it. But see, it, it doesn't stop it for this building. There's so many more things he wants to do. Not just my life, but with your life. But it starts with making Him Lord. So tonight, I'm going to continue to declare that He's Lord of my life. I'm going to declare this. You declare what you need to declare. But I'm going to declare He's my Lord. And I'm going to say, Lord, what will You have me what will you have me do, Lord? Do you want me to do this? I believe tonight is to prepare us for the week that Bob is coming. Because I believe this next coming week, next Saturday night it begins, a week from now. We're going to have... How many services? Ten services in nine days. Ten services in nine days. And I truly believe that boxes are going to be shattered. I truly believe that we're going to be stretched more than we've ever been stretched before. I truly believe we're going to have more change in our lives than that, that have ever happened before. I truly believe there's going to be yokes completely broken. Chains that are going to fall off. Religious ideas and thinking that are just going to totally go away that week. I believe that. And we need it. If we want more of the presence of the Lord, we need every single bondage broken. And I believe it's going to happen. And tonight is the start by making Jesus my Lord. By saying, He's my Lord. By confessing, you're my Lord. By saying, Jesus, what will you have me to do tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? What, waking, waking up and say, Lord, what will you have me do today? 
It doesn't mean you can't run a schedule. It's not what I said. But Lord, what do you want me to do? Who am I going to encounter that needs you? Who needs prayer today? Who needs an encounter with Jesus? Who needs a suddenly? Because I'm willing. Because the power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in me. And when I wake up, the enemy goes, oh no, they just got out of bed. Because the enemy is powerless to what God can bring in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, (laughs) you're such a good God. Your goodness is what leads us to repentance. Your goodness is so good, we can't even imagine it all. It's beyond our comprehension in the natural. But Father, Your goodness, we can tap into it by Your Spirit. And by our Spirit being one with Your Spirit, we can experience it, we can tap into it, and we can realize how amazing good You are to us. And Father, that Your presence is going to come upon us, in us, and over us to a higher and greater degree from this night. Let's just say this together. I receive Your presence to a greater degree. I receive Your Holy Spirit in my life. I receive Your Holy Spirit upon me to give me power to do exploits because that power that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of me. And I will make Jesus Lord of my life. And I will wake up saying, Lord, what will You have me do? Hallelujah. Let's just praise Him. Thank You, Lord. We're going to see more things this next week. We praise You, Father. We give You honor and glory. Is there anybody here that wants to make a definitive decision for Jesus tonight? Say, you know, I know I've known about Jesus my whole life, but tonight I'm going to make Him my Lord. He is Lord, not just in some of my life, but He's Lord in everything I do. If that's you, I want to pray with you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And and the only reason I'm asking this, I, I, I wasn't sure that I would do it. The only reason I'm asking is sometimes you need a line in the sand and, and to say, uh, you remember that night, um, what is it, October the 2nd? October the 2nd. I made Jesus my Lord that night. Sometimes we need that for in the future because in the future, the enemy will come and try to confuse you. And, and you have to remind the enemy, no, 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 Jesus is my Lord. He's my, what He says goes. I'm going to serve Him and be, because that's my God. And, and he's, my, he's my friend. He's holy. He's amazing. He's got a great plan for me. And October the 2nd, I made Him 100% Lord of my life on everything I knew up to that point. Thank You, Jesus. Let's just keep worshiping. We we worship You, Lord. We thank You, Lord. Maybe it's a certain situation that you're making Him Lord over. And tonight you have to say, you know what? October the 2nd, I made Jesus Lord over my life at that point. I made Him Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Honey, you want to come up here? We worship You. We worship You. Father, we thank You. We give You honor and we give You glory. Father, just the the mark in the sand, the stake in the ground, if You will, of tonight, Jesus is Lord. And Father, we give just the humility that Christina has shown to come up here you ministered to her that somewhere in her life, Jesus was not Lord. But after tonight, October the 2nd, 
you are Lord. So what I want you to do, Christina, is just simply in a receiving position, just say, Jesus, I receive your Lordship over my entire life. Give me more light. Show me where I haven't given everything over because you're better, you're best for me. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Father. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. I, tr I believe that things were changed. You're going to go home different tonight. The Holy Spirit ministered to more than just Christina tonight on different areas in your life. And you're going to say, Lord, what will you have me do? He's got all the answers. <laughs> Sumbo riba soho kohola kobo riba sata shan si kili bo. Now that you've made Lord of Jesus Lord of your life, walk in him. Walk in the power, the might, because he that's in you is greater than the he's of the world. Lord wants to, to show us all his goodness and mercy. Thank you. I think somebody had this question, so I'm going to address it and answer it. So why would the Lord give a tongue for the church? Why would the Holy Spirit give a tongue for the church? Why doesn't He just speak it out in English? Because you have to submit your tongue to the Holy Spirit. That's why He does it. And it's another place where you have to experience His Lordship. That's why there's tongues and interpretations to the assembly according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And it's because of submitting ourselves to His tongue, His Lordship as for Him. It's a submission exercise that you just witnessed. But go out in power. Greater is He that is in you recognize it, grab a hold of it, live it. Hallelujah. Well, we will not see you Tuesday night, and we will see you next Saturday night, and come ready, come prepared, come get ready, Hang, you know, come with your suspenders on, grab a hold of them, sit in your chair, because when Bob takes off, you're going to want to hang on for the ride. So come prayed up. Spend time seeking the Lord before this next week starts. Because we got nine days, ten services. It's going to be a long week. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to walk into that anointing on the first night. And then it's going to increase on Sunday morning. Then it's going to increase on Sunday night. And it's going to increase every subsequent night until the end of the week. And once you taste it, you're, not, you're going to want to attend every single one of them. And if you miss one, you're going to be like, ah, oh, man, I miss the glory of God. Because that's where my faith is and my expectations are. We've never done this before. It's the first time. I don't have butterflies sitting here, oh dear Lord, what are we going to do or how is this going to be? I have butterflies with excitement of what God is going to do. It's your choice on whether you're afraid or excited. Same things happening in your stomach, right? Same things. It's your choice to be excited about it or afraid of, afraid of what's happening. Fear has the same symptoms in your body. And then we have a choice on what we're going to do. So hand out that little paper. Pray about who to give it to. Because I believe there's a whole bunch of people, they're going to receive suddenlies this next week. 
not by you privately, and then the subsequent subsequent week when Bob's here, there's going to be a lot more suddenlies, encounters with God, people being touched, people being healed, people being set free. And I believe there's divine appointments attached to every single one of those cards that we have. Pray on who to hand out to, who you're supposed to minister to. Take them with you to the store. Take them with you everywhere you go because the Lord can say, hey, they need a card. And the last thing you want to do is be like, ah, oh, uh, Lord, I forgot my, left them at the house. Right? And then you're going to have to embarrass yourself by going up and telling them about it. Right? So just take them with you. Hand them out. And I believe, fasten your faith on this, this place is going to be packed. This place is going to be packed. And there's going to be people radically changed and set free. Amen? Thank you for coming to Church of the Word tonight. And we'll see you next week.